Good afternoon and welcome to the show. Now, this isn't my 31-day challenge. That finished yesterday. Today is the first of my regular live weekly shows on gender. And this is the Gender Speaker Show. That's what I'm going to be uh, promoting it as. So um, bring that up so you can see that. This is the Gender Speaker Show Show. This show which is going to be on a Friday at the moment with 4.30. Next week it'll be 4 o'clock. But I'm going to play around a little bit until I find the time that works best. That This is going to be a show about gender issues in all sorts of ways. So it's not just about the trans issues. This is about gender equality, LGBT issues, anything to do in any loose way with the issues around gender um, and trying to create a fairer world in which the person's gender stops being an issue. That's really what it's all about. And uh, this is going to be a weekly video podcast on all things gender. And uh, today, um, as it happened, I'd already got lined up a speaker f- or a, 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 a guest for today. Uh, and my guest today is uh, Rebecca Jones. And I'm going to bring her in uh, in a moment um, because Rebecca is uh, she's an author. Um, she's done a book on business startups, largely for women. And she's just done a new book on enterprise within and has a good focus on helping women to be more successful. So <clears throat> let me bring in uh, Rebecca now. Welcome to the show, Rebecca. Good to meet you. And you too. Nice to meet you again and uh, to, to join you on your new show. So this is, uh, this is all good fun because I, I, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you've been a speaker for quite a while now. Um, I, I've noticed that speakers are reluctant, actually, to get involved in the whole business of live video. And, and in fact, video itself is still something which is <clears throat> uh, it's not a main part of a speaker's business, is it? No, I suppose, um, yeah, some of them are using video, but maybe just as a self-promotional tool. So it kind of is a, hi, this is me, I'm outside this venue, that type of video. Some of them may be doing video to sort of sell products. Um, but for me, a lot of the time, it's just about connecting with people, um, getting to know somebody really. And for me, I, I think you're the same. I like to get to know people and know whether or not I could work with them, whether or not we have similar views. And and that's a brilliant way of doing it sort of via live conversation rather than me just speaking to a camera and you just listening in. Yeah, but <clears throat> it is still, I think, a good way. I mean, I, I found I, I, I struggled with my confidence on camera. I have no idea why. Uh, I can get up in front of the stage of thousands of people, no problem at all. Uh, put me in front of a camera on my own in a room, I suddenly become a bumbling wreck. <laughs> I can't, can't oh, get it. Uh, and I, this 31 days has actually to help me get rid of that because now I know yeah, I'm going to make mistakes and that's okay. Uh, it's live. This is, this is live broadcast. I, I don't have a whole production team around me. I don't have auto cue and all those things going. It's just me, a piece of software and a guest. Uh, or just me on my own, and we can and we can chat. Uh, and so that's yeah. it, it's all beginning to work a little bit better. It's so interesting. Be quite... <laughs> yeah, I was going to say with with women. I think a lot of the time when I talk to women about using video or webinars as we used to use. I mean, I still do webinars. I love webinars, and a lot of women have said to me over the years, "Oh no, I don't do webinars." And then when I ask them for their reasons. They're not really reasons. I think they're just excuses. And then there's this whole, oh, and anyway, people are going to look at me. And I mean, I, I have to sort of hands up here. I just sort of thought this afternoon, oh, gosh, I'm speaking to Ricky in a while. I'm just going to brush my hair and make sure I look OK. <laughs> so, I don't know. Is that a female thing or is that just, you know, is that what's holding? I don't know if that's holding people back. But maybe it is. Yeah, but that's, that's the same as speak. And if you were going to get up in front of an audience and speak, you'd you'd check yourself and make sure you looked OK. Um, so, I th- I, no, I don't think that's uh, particularly a woman thing. But I, I do think there is a sense of, oh, my God. I, I think the thing is, if I get up and speak, it's very transient. It's gone. Nobody's going to actually be able to you know, bring it back up and say, oh, look what you did there. Whereas if I do it here, I know that they can say, I just watched your video. You know, and everybody's still watching it. We can, we can still see, yeah, that, yeah, that you know, ah, uh, no, but... I, I think what happened, what I needed to get past was that that consciousness about the camera. Uh, so now it's actually OK, because, I, yeah, after you've done 30 days of it, suddenly I find the camera is a friend. I'm chatting to it and uh, it's OK. And I, I, so I, I can see <clears throat> you, be, you behind it. I don't have to put screens and pictures be, ar- around it. I'm, and I'm getting quite used to chatting to the camera and knowing that, that actually is chatting to you. It's still 
a very great temptation to look down at the picture of you on the screen. <laughs> I'm not there, but uh, there we go. So anyway, um, let's uh, uh, have a quick little look at, at this. Now, you've got two books. I'm going to bring these books up so we can have a look at them. We've got Business Startups. This was the original book. So how, how long ago was this one? <clears throat> question isn't it so uh, this is a, a, a version of an original book that I did about eight nine years ago oh, and then um, this is the updated version of it if you like but you think oh didn't you so, oh, so, 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 the new, the, so this new book here that you've just launched yeah this, this is a, a new oops Oh dear! See, you said about live calls. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. Right. So, um, yes. So, the new book um, is about enterprise, but from a different format. In the fact that it's about enterprising staff, whereas the original book was my work on how do we develop enterprising people and can you be an entrepreneur if you like as a female. So it's very much the first book based on my experience as a female and how other women might um, approach being entrepreneurial, um, whereas this one is about anybody being entrepreneurial. I, I just think anyone has the ability to be entrepreneurial if they want to be. Oh, oh, oh. oh, sorry. Let me get, switch this off, and then that'll be good. <laughs> right, go. Yeah, sorry. No, no problem at all. <clears throat> I know what it's like. It's uh, <laughs> the off button is so difficult to find when you're in, <laughs> when it's annoying, you, isn't it? So you look. You just anyway. You just launched this yes uh, last week. Yeah, it? Or literally yesterday. So this is this is it. I've got it in my hands at last. It's so lovely to. I don't know about anybody else, but whenever you write a book, you spend so much time on it on screen, and then you see your own printed versions of it. And until you actually get the book in your hands, it sort of doesn't seem real particularly until you actually get it. And uh, yeah, it's lovely to actually have I, that. And, I was sorting out a lockup, sorting out a lockup the other uh, day, and I came across a small, small remaining supply of my second book, which was the ABC of the World Wide Web, uh, oh. second, 1998, and had a look through that. I thought, oh my God, our life has changed. Twenty years ago, what a different world it was. <laughs> Takes us back, doesn't it? <laughs> it's, it's beyond even updating now. It's literally so far out of date. Oh. Everything was wrong. Do you know? I mean, I read it through. I thought there's not even single mention of Google. Google didn't even exist. <laughs> <laughs> the old dial-up I remember running my business with the old dial-up and oh I mean right. yeah th this is the thing and I guess I mean I started my first business at the age of 19 and that's 26 years ago now wow, yeah. and so when people are talking about how business has changed over the years I'm like you have no idea <laughs> because it really has you know I mean that my first business was with a I used the telephone at the on the corner of the street. You know, the telephone box for my business, the first business I had. I didn't need to have a telephone, let alone the internet. So I, when people talk about running a business now being difficult, I don't think they have a clue. No, it's different. But yeah, it's different. I, I, think, I mean, the thing is, having access to the world is okay, except that everybody else has got access as well. So, so you're running into a into a place where it's it's so crowded. It's really really hard. To actually get yeah. yourself heard um, when everybody else is shouting, and uh, so you, I, I see, keep seeing references to, and I'll bring this up: the uh, red shoe businesswoman. So, yeah. um, so t t I mean, that's a lovely well, brand. So t t <laughs> tell me how that brand came about. Well, this is an interesting conversation to have, and actually. Um, Let's come back to is it a lovely brand in a moment because that's quite an interesting conversation in general. But anyway, that is my brand. I've had it for many years now. I think probably a good that I've been known as the Red Shoe Biz Woman. I've worn red shoes for work um, for a good 15 years or not, if not more. And I've only worn red shoes all of the time for 10 years. So I've got red wellies, I've got red walking boots, red trainers, you name it. And it came about that 
When I was younger, I wanted a pair of red shoes. I seen them in the window. They were a pair of start right Mary Janes. They were little T-bar shoes. I wanted them for school. And my dad said, no, you can't have them because they don't polish up. Um, and I didn't even know what that meant, but I do now because you can't polish red paint and shoes. Once you've scuffed them, they're scuffed. Um, but that's why we, I couldn't have them because he couldn't afford more than one pair of shoes. And so I had black ones. And my best friend had the red Mary Jane shoes when we went to school. Um, so I kind of just wanted the shoes. I, I, there was no real reason behind it. I just wanted them. And when I was running my um, second business in my early 20s, uh, I was having quite a bad day. In fact, it was a, one of those days where as a female, you just feel that you're not being heard in the boardroom. You're just not getting your message out there. I just felt that it was a bit, I was a young woman running quite a, a high growth business. And I just felt that I wasn't really being heard. And as I walked back from the meeting to my office, I walked past the same shoe shop I'd been in as a child. And there in the window was a pair of red patent shoes. They weren't Mary Jane start right? So they had beautiful heel on them. And I just thought, I'm going to have those make myself feel better. I think that was it. I just wanted to make myself feel better. That, for that split second, that was the aim. And I put them on and I felt quite good. And the following day, I put them on and I went to another meeting with them on. And I felt really confident. And I was sat in this boardroom in my normal suit, you know, having the normal boardroom conversations you have. And when I was not sure about speaking and, and voicing my opinion, I kind of just looked down and glanced down under the table and I just smiled inwardly to myself. I had red shoes on under the table and all of the men had their black shoes on. Are you funny? Um, and I just thought, you know, you, you lot don't even know that I've got red shoes on, but I, I do. And it gave me an inner confidence, I guess, in that moment. And, and I kind of liked it. So I reused it. And so over a period of time, every time I wasn't sure about the situation, I wasn't feeling very confident, I put a pair of red shoes on and I think, come on, we're ready to go. So for me, when I was younger, it was an inner confidence thing. And then it kind of grew and, and it would be a joke. People would say, oh, she's got her red shoes on today. She's going to mean business. So it was kind of a joke and it's, it's grown from there. And then somebody said to me, as I say, many, many years ago, come on, Mrs. Red Shoes, what are you going to do now? Um, and I think it just sort of stuck and it kind of, for me, it helps people understand a little bit of who I am, that there's a little bit of fun side of me. I'm willing to laugh at myself. Yeah. And yeah, I also appreciate that a lot of what I do, to be honest with you, Ricky, a lot of what I do when we're talking about business and getting staff more engaged is about helping people shift from whatever is stopping them from achieving what they can achieve. And, and a lot of that is about mindset and a lot of that is about confidence. And sometimes finding something that makes you feel good, that's that's a help. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to help, isn't it? Um, but, so, yeah. so, so, it's, so your red, the red shoes have become a metaphor for confidence for you, haven't they? They're... They have, really. Yeah, they have. But, but interestingly, I mean, you said is a lovely brand and, and majority of people do say that. But occasionally yeah. I do get negative feedback about the brand. And uh, that's always been from men. So it's an interesting one, isn't it? Whether or not, again, it's that language that for them, the concept of shoes and the fact that I use a, a heeled shoe, does that suggest female? Is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not terribly worried about it. It, it works for me. Um, it's a brand that most people associate me with quite easily. They, they know that's who I am. Uh, it doesn't put off my corporate clients because I have some very big corporate clients. It doesn't bother them. So I have a, 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 um, a speaker friend, friend in the friend States, States, Michael Karpovich. Oops, we've got a, some feedback. Oh, can you manage? Is it okay now? Uh, yeah, I don't know quite where that's happened, come from. Are you okay? All right. I think we're okay. okay. Um, and uh, he wears he wears some red trainers. When he's oh, yeah, yeah. And it's all part of his uh, part of his his brand. Part of what he's talking about uh, is has the he has these um, red trainers on. And I think it's important. Yeah. It's important for speakers to have something about them which which makes them different. I mean, I know that when I changed gender, it brought it virtually brought my speaking career to a standstill. 
Um, in fact, it, did, it wasn't virtually, it was a dead, a dead stop. Within six months of changing gender, um, I'd worked in the financial services industry, talked mostly for the past previous 10 years on financial services technology. I was like the technology guru in the financial services industry. I had columns in five or six of the financial services press. Uh, mm -hmm. It was myself and one other guy. And uh, and all of a sudden, it was like, oh, no, 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 no. I, I even was in the middle of a phone call with somebody I booked to, just to go and do a free talk for a life insurance association meeting. And I said, oh, by the way, you do, you do know I changed my gender. He said, what? I said, I, I've changed my gender. He says, oh, good God, no, 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 no. Oh, my, no, no, our members couldn't handle that. No, no, sorry, no, no, I'll cancel. Boom, put the phone down. Wow. End of conversation. I thought, oh, my God. So so I had to go away. And, and um, f for a while, I thought, yeah, I, I need to go and actually get, that, get this gender thing together just so I know <clears throat> what I do. Because learning to live in a new gender is a – I mean, mm. you don't realize because you learn as you're growing. By the time you get to adult, you've already had you know, 20 years learning about being an agenda. And I had to learn it much, yeah. much faster. I I knew nothing about what to wear properly. I, I'd taken lessons and everything else. But, yeah, you know, I, I had to look and think, right, what can I do so that people will book me because I'm transgender rather than yes. not book me because I'm transgender? And that was it. I had to... Uh, and that was actually about being very out about it and saying, oh, let's talk about that. This is obviously yeah. a topic people don't understand. Let's, let me talk about that. And then, of course, the, the whole issue of gender started to come up because I started to realize I did. I went to Hull University, did a master's in gender, and I suddenly started to realize, you know, I'm, I'm seeing the world that women have to live in in a very different light and probably more so than it, women can because, because you just live with it. It's just the way life is. I was yeah. looking at it and thinking, hell no, <laughs> this is, it shouldn't be like that. Uh, so so, so I, I became like the, uh, the the worst campaigner for anti-smoking is someone who used to smoke. <laughs> but the worst campaigner yeah. for gender equality is somebody who used to be a man. It's, <laughs> yeah, but I think it's it's interesting, isn't it? And and I know we've, I, we've already spoken about this, this concept of, you know, is it that we do – we don't realize as a woman often what we're trying to deal with because we don't know it from the other side, whereas maybe right. you've seen it from both sides. And, you know, sometimes I just think, well, this is just how it is for everyone. And then you have a conversation with some of the, the men within our industry of speaking and realize, oh, no, it's not the same for them. They, they don't have the same problems. And, no, you know, I mean, it's still fairly unusual to have a female um as the keynote oh it's, it's getting better but i must have met yeah. it is but it's still not that usual and i regularly will be not called the keynote address um oh. and yeah i might be being paid the same as the, the gentleman that's speaking um but he's the keynote and that's i always find that really interesting well you know again it's that subtlety of language sometimes isn't it and you know that subtlety of um, where we place things on an agenda, depending on um, gender, and then I sort of think, well, am I being overly sensitive? So then I think, well, I won't, I won't raise that. But then sometimes some of the the guys within the industry are now beginning to raise it, and you think, well, if they're noticing that it's not right, then it's not right. You know, it isn't. I mean, you mentioned that you wanted to talk about uh, emotive language um, mm. it, it, from. Because, I mean, one of the things I have that shocked me was when I started to look at the definition of harassment. Um, mm. The definition of harassment is actually quite um, – it, it's actually a lot stricter than most people think because it's anything which creates an intimidating, offensive, um, mm. harass, uh, yeah, harassing environment. Um, so so if, I, if I do anything that makes people feel upset or is intimidating or um, – uh, yeah, Offense. It, it's it's much much bigger than just doing something physically to someone. So just yes. having a conversation in the workplace um, about women in a very derogatory way, or about gay men in a derogatory, way, or about trans people, or or about disabled people, or about anyone really. Yeah. yeah. Um, what I don't know in that conversation is whether the person who's in the conversation or listening to it 
might be yeah, closet trans, closet gay. They might have a partner who's gay or trans or disabled. They might have a, um, you know, might be married to a Muslim woman or Muslim man. Uh, so, uh, I don't know any of this. And yet, yeah, you know, within our equality law, which people don't realize, um, if you are associated with someone as a protected characteristic, you have just the same rights as if you have that characteristic. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, it's not just about the conversations that people have individually, um, but also things said from often the stage um, where yeah. people will um, at a conference use words like you guys and meaning everybody. But it, it doesn't mean everybody. It, it doesn't, you know, and it's. Um, lack of inclusivity in conversations as well and that sort of um un sort of appreciative i feel if i say these things because you know one of the the conversations i've been having recently with a lot of my clients is um and i've been doing some 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 workshops around this about we don't know what's going on in somebody's life we don't yeah. know what, what else they're having to cope with in the background and that something we might say might have a knock-on effect or, um, uh, you know, change the way they feel about something or think about something. And again, coming back to that mindset work that I do and confidence work that I do, that those things that are said often off the cuff, often without thought, and possibly sometimes without even malice, can really lodge in somebody's mind and, and either deter them from doing something or hopefully spark them into action. But, you know, not necessarily in a good way, but as you say, but yeah, it does. So we do need to be really careful. And I think a lot of the time when we're um, maybe believing that we're in including people and particularly around, for me, that gender issue, trying to include people, but actually the words they're saying kind of almost say, well, we are including you, but not really. Um, so things yeah. around, you know, well, um, I mean, I used to get really, really angry and I know people used to laugh and say, oh, Rebecca gets really angry about it. But the amount of uh, networking groups that meet for breakfast and as a mother with young children at that time in business, it was just impossible. There's no way I could meet for breakfast. I had no desire to have a sausage bap at seven o'clock in the morning, knowing that my children might not be happy because they've got to go on the school run without me now if i'm away with work clearly i make provisions but that's different that's because i'm being paid and i'm with a client and i've got to do that but if if you know we're talking about trying to get people more involved in the business of running businesses and yet we're putting barriers automatically in their way it drives me nuts you can probably tell by my yeah i mean uh, uh, I just even lunchtime is probably better for those sort of network meetings, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it is, it is difficult. It, you know, I know we can't appease everyone. We can't have everything suitable for everyone. But it's about having choice. It's about having choice. And, yeah. you know, and again, coming back to language, we have a choice of what words we use. And if we're saying that we are professional people, we should be aware of what language we use and how that can or can't affect somebody really and what they then choose to do really. Yeah. Yeah, I, there was a, <clears throat> I don't know whether you saw the interesting um, TV, two part t TV program on um, where they were, that they, the, the concept they were putting forward was what, what if we had, if we got rid of gender, no more boys and girls. Uh, in, in fact, that wasn't what they were dealing. What they were dealing with was basically a problem of gender inequality. And the way in which even at the age of seven or eight, that inequality was already being embedded. Uh, and for mm -hmm. example, the, the teacher who was an extraordinarily good teacher, engaged with, the, with them, well, a male teacher, um, called the girls love, sweetie pie and things like that. Wow. And called all the boys mate, um, fella, uh, lad. So just simply in that way in which he said, you know, um, Lottie, honey, come and do this or, and, and um, you know, John, mate, come and come and come come and help me with this. Uh, and that was, and the other thing was that, uh, and I know this from my unconscious bias work that I do. Uh, teachers are more likely to get a boy to respond to a question to engage in something than a girl. 
So yeah. what they did was they, they did something really interesting is they got the children to basically put up a, a, um, a an unhappy face on a board every time he used some gender um, ad on, ad adverb to, to connect to, to the girls. So if he said sweetie pie or honey or love, uh, that was it. He got a, 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 a an unhappy face went up on the board. And the other thing was when he had to ask a question, he had a yeah. basket full a basket full of names on balls. So he'd have to put his hand in and pull a ball and say, okay, fine. And and randomly pick people. So it would move yeah. the element of bias and choice from what he was doing. So And and that's an interesting one, isn't it? And we were coming back to and if you come back to the conversation we were just having about the fact that there's still more male speakers at conferences and that's not just about the ones that are being paid that's also about the organizations oh, you know okay. who are running the conference who have got their chief exec on the stage and have got their financial director on the stage and just because of the fact that there are more men in those positions then they do tend to have more men on the stage but you know how do we get it so the process um, and I've had this conversation with somebody recently about why do they not have more women? And they said, oh, the women don't put themselves forward. So then it's almost like, oh, well, is it our fault now? Um, and why is it that we don't put ourselves forward? Is that coming back to that confidence thing? Is that about that uh, we're not pushy? I, I don't I don't know. I don't know what the answers are. I'm just sort of putting it out there that, you know, could it be that, um that maybe sometimes we do have to take some responsibility for it because we're not uh, we're not in the game in the same way. So therefore, if we're not in the game in the same way, we're not going to be spotted in the same way. But this is where we come down to the fact that things are organised around a, a male structure. Now, I, <clears throat> this is where I get myself into all kinds of trouble, and I'm quite happy for <laughs> trouble on this one. See, I, I think that men organise around a hierarchical um, structure. Um, mm. And the, the goal of men within an organization is get to the top um, and work your way up the organization until you are top dog. That's basically the whole king chicken. That's what everybody's going for. <laughs> uh, and it's the same structure that's used in the army. And unfortunately, the language follows through. We take that military structure, we took it into business. We still call um, you know, the staff troops. We call them you know, um, the, the, yeah. the leaders. Yeah, uh, of organizations uh they talk about going to battle with competition and it, and the whole thing has still got this whole military language around it yeah. which just doesn't work for women now i was listening to a really excellent talk by a woman who runs a, a high-tech company in leeds and she said this is our company structure and she showed a normal hierarchical structure she said well let me explain this is what we have to put in the annual report and this is what i need to put in when i show men how our organization has worked and then she removed that and put a new slide up. And she said, this is how it actually works. <laughs> and it was just this spider's web of connections <laughs> all over the place. And I thought, absolutely, that is it. Um, yeah. yeah. The quote I've, I've got, a woman doesn't want to be at the top of the organization. She wants to be at the center of it. Ah, yeah, that's a lovely phrase. Yeah, and, I think that's... that's fundamental difference that actually what women do is they flatten the organization instead of the hierarchy we flatten it all down <clears throat> the leaders are at the center of the organization connected out to a network of people around but actually it's all at the same level now i didn't know but anita roddick apparently scrapped the manager's role in the in the body shop shops that she ran because she said whenever she promoted someone to manager the relationships between the girls in the – and it was nearly always women working there – but the relationship between the women working in the store disintegrated because all of a sudden this hierarchical thing came in, which which actually it seemed women are not comfortable with. It's, and what I noticed is that if – yeah, it, it, in a male world, if somebody drops off the edge, oh, yeah. <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> Never mind. One more out of the pot. Uh, yeah. Whereas for women, we're, oh, my God, no, 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 come on, let's help you back up again. You, you, yeah. Yeah. And if something gets too high, then we, we have a tendency to pull them back down again. You know, just just remember where you are. Let's, let's walk it. Whereas for men, yeah, it's about yeah. competition. Mm. And, you know, men have fights and battles and to get to, to who wins. And that's okay. That's the way it is. But it's 
Uh, and it is a completely different way in which the engagement process takes place. Now, I did some work for BP, um, and they mm. ran a meeting, Women in the Network, and they had some of their senior male executives come to attend the meeting. And at the end of the meeting, the executive at the in head of this uh, plant in uh, in I had a word with the women who ran this thing and said, look, you've you've really got this all all wrong because uh, I couldn't follow what on earth was going on in the meeting. It was everybody was chatting over each other. The whole thing was a complete mess. <clears throat> How on earth you came out with decisions at the end of it, I have no idea at all. But we will help you put some structure into the meeting to make it more effective. <laughs> she said within three months, half the women had stopped coming to the meetings. Mm. Yeah. And she went back to him and she said, look, yes, you don't yes. get this. This is how we do it. We get a result because we chat stuff around and then we make a decision. And we don't go yeah. you know, piece by piece through a structured agenda. It doesn't work for us. So the guys eventually said, okay, fine, we let you do it. If you get the results, just do it your way. And that was the yeah. important thing they had to learn. You just have to recognize people do things differently, step back, mm -hmm. let it happen. Yeah, and it's interesting because in the, the new book about sort of enterprise and getting staff to be more enterprising, I haven't particularly focused in on gender, but I mean, that's a really interesting conversation to have in the fact that a lot of what I'm talking about is it being more collaborative in its approach, which, as we know, is a commonly seen as a more female way of, of working, because the idea or the premise behind enterprise within is that um, we allow staff to spot opportunities, to see where there's problems and to find solutions for themselves, to come up with any of the ideas themselves and to do it together, not for themselves. So they do it together for the benefit of the whole organisation and for everyone within it, not just so that I come up with a fantastic idea, I'm going to run with it so that me, 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 I get to the top and I get some sort of accolade for doing it. Because we know that long term, that's just not going to work for businesses. Because no. if everyone's dashing in their own direction, we've just got no synergy. We've just got no sort of uh, interconnection of departments. And that's why we're working in all these silos all the time. Um, whereas the women will do the whole chatter, 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 and everyone's wondering what they're doing. But actually, the chatter element, I suppose, um, which a lot of us tend to do at the beginning is only for a very short period of time, but it's getting to know somebody underneath the surface so I know where you're coming from. So, um, really, this with, with working with a friend of mine recently, within the first few minutes of our first meeting, I knew that she had children, I knew where they were in the school sort of, you know, stages. I knew all of that sort of stuff. So then when I started discussing the project with her, I already said to her, well, you won't want to do that until at least the second week of September when the kids have settled back into school. So she didn't even have to say, yeah, September's not easy for me or the summer's not easy for me. I already knew that because we'd had that conversation. So is it important? Well, possibly it's not hugely important, but I think that chatter element of women that element of wanting to understand each other and where we're coming from enables us to put together projects ideas develop things to suit that person very naturally <laughs> so therefore they don't have to say uh, i can't do a meeting after three o'clock because i'm on the school run because we wouldn't even suggest it because we know they would be so you know it, it's those sorts of things i think that we just we're seeing changing in the workplace. Oh, it's so slow, isn't it? <laughs> it's just like, yeah. I, I just think back to some of the stuff I've done on gender. And it's going back years and years and years. And I've been invited to a thing at the weekend about gender and um, pay. Um, and there's a lot of stuff going on in Cardiff at the moment, where, near where I live, around the fact that I think it was something like, um, I can't remember now the figures off the top of my head. I'm rubbish at figures. But I think it was like one in nine women who are on maternity leave will automatically lose their job before they go back. Yeah, it's just not good enough. You know, you're on maternity leave and people are saying, why should they keep the job open for them? And you just think, well, oh. you know, th these are not conversations we should still be having in 2017, surely. But, you, you, but we are. But you keep a job open for someone because they, because they bring 
an enormous amount to that job. They know the job. They know the people. They know the interactions. They they're committed and loyal to the organisation. And oh yeah, my God, it yeah. takes so so long to get that those qualities. Yeah. Um, and the commitment somebody... and the loyalty is huge often by these women, women who are going back after maternity leave because they appreciate that they have had that time out. And not only that, they've now set up their childcare around either the location of the office or the hours that they're getting from that organisation. So then when another job comes up, that that's another thing to stop them maybe going for that job because they're thinking you know coming back to a man going for promotion they're just going great that's promotion whereas a lot of women that i talk to will say to me well i would have gone for it but it wasn't the flexible hours it was in a different yeah. office i couldn't have done the childcare, yeah. or whatever it is that's holding the back i know it's not as common now as it was when my children were younger i mean mine are grown up now um but but it's still a it is still an issue for a lot of women and all who takes on that child care responsibilities because of course we've got but many, is, many more men this is part of what, why i don't understand why um online so, um, engagement online working hasn't really taken off so much uh, I, I remember you know years and years ago people were already talking about um uh, people working from home people working and engaging um very well i i, I worked for a software company where my, my boss um the, the, who was the sort of european marketing director i was sales and marketing manager and he was regularly flying to austin texas and I remember once he actually flew all the way to Austin, Texas for a three hour meeting uh, and then left the meeting and went straight back to the airport, got on a flight and flew straight back. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, well, why would you do that? That, that was that, that's an incredible amount of traveling just to actually get at a meeting. Why? But why, why yeah. wouldn't you have used Zoom or well, then? I mean, there, there were products around that there was certainly com uh, certainly conferencing was available. Um, mm -hmm. Video conferencing has been available for years. Now, for women, the, the whole idea of being able to work from home, uh, have a have a meeting at the office, do do the work you need. I, I'm I'm struggling to find out what see what you cannot do at your home with a well set up remote office. That that you, in fact, in some ways, it's actually a lot better because what that doesn't happen when you're working here is you don't get people wandering past your desk and distracting you for half an hour over some chat about something that's been going on. You don't get stuck talking about Coronation Street around the coffee machine. It's, <laughs> um, I, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I think it's a balance to be had, hasn't, isn't there? Yes. And again, it comes back to the fact that for some people, they probably wouldn't like the uh, remoteness or the loneliness maybe of working from home. Um, so maybe they would need a combination of some office space, some home working. But it comes back to flexibility, and I, I don't. And I think about women and childcare. I think it's about um, you know, as we get older and we've got older uh, elderly parents that we need to sort of be aware of or, or, or supporting and helping. And coming back to what we said earlier about the fact we don't know what else is going on in other people's lives. Sometimes people do need some space to cope with other things that they're dealing with, and you know, possibly by having those options of having some days working from home, some days not. And um, I know I've had this conversation with my husband recently. He has a very senior member of staff who's, who's lost their partner recently and um, about the fact that they've come back to work, but that there's a, a, a agreement that if there's a day when they don't feel able to be in the office with everyone, there's just a text message that says, I'm gonna work from home today. Yeah, yeah. And you know why? And that's absolutely fine. And it might not be first thing if they're having a bad morning, but they'll get on with it at some point during the day or into the evening. And, and then that's absolutely OK. And it's got to be better than losing that member of staff and the effect it would have on that person if we right. had to no, let them go. You know, <laughs> no. uh, but that's, that's kind of it. Yeah, we, I mean, I will go off topic, but it's just that is it. I think it is that same thing um, of having that being more inclusive being more aware of people coming at things from different angles and having different needs at different times and trying to help them as best we can um by being a caring employer really i think that's Absolutely. The, so yeah. 
we'll, we'll begin to wrap this up now. Um, t t just, just sort of summarize, can you? If somebody buys Enterprise Within, um, what mo what's the main things they're going to get from the, from the book? So the, the book, the idea is it's about how do we embrace a culture of enterprise within an organization? Right. Um, how, how do we get that so that staff are more enterprising, so that they, they know it's their job, it's their responsibility to meet the needs of customers and to help the organization be as successful as it can. Um, so it's about how can your staff answer the uh, organizational growth element, if you like, of, of business development. And it gives you all the tools that you'd need to encourage your staff to be more enterprising, to overcome those blockages, I call them brilliance blockers. We have lots of brilliance blockers, don't we, in the workplace? People who say, oh, we can't do that. Oh, we shouldn't be doing that. Or we've tried that before and it didn't work. So how do we overcome those brilliance blockers and enable people to be more enterprising? Because I think that Moving forward, we're going to have to move business. And as leaders, we just can't be doing that on our own all the time. We need the team behind us to support us. Um, so, yeah, that's the concept. So it's available on Amazon now. And, um, yeah. I saw that. You can get it on Amazon. Um, what I will do is just to um, – I'm just going to put into the uh, – um, whoops – here in the uh, ch uh, chat online, um, uh, I'd forgotten to do that. We've got uh, so. What's the difference between the biz, Red Shoe Biz Woman and the Red Shoe Biz Academy? Ah, uh, the Red Shoe Biz Academy is my online learning platform for women business owners. So that's uh, oh, right. yeah, training programs for female business owners. Uh, and like you were saying, yeah, they do want to do things remotely. Um, so we do a, um, an online mastermind group so they can um, join us online. They don't have to take time to travel to a venue and the day of masterminding. We do that all online. So that's, uh, that's the Red Shoe Business Academy. OK, so we've got the uh, Red, Shoe, Red Shoe Business Academy. Um, you can go to that Facebook um, or the Red Shoe Business Woman, which is another page. Um, both of which have got all sorts of information about you and your books and uh, how you can get them. They're all available on Amazon, so you can just look up there yeah. on Amazon. Um, and uh, I, I think I saw a web page as well, isn't it? What was the? Uh... Oh yeah, the web page for the book is um, www.enterprisewithin.com. So I'll just type that in. Here, this is a fabulous bit. So it's www. Find me. The brilliant thing about being the Red Shoe Biz Woman is if you put Rebecca Jones, the Red Shoe Biz Woman, in, you will always find me. <laughs> oh, we've got Enterprise Within. So it's www.enterprisewithin.com. Is that right? Yep. Cool. Excellent. So uh, they can find that there. <clears throat> right. So thank you very much indeed, Rebecca. That's been a really interesting okay. track. We've uh, we've we've probably you know tried to solve the, all the world's problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly it when really, it comes to the weekly show together. <laughs> yes, I know. We'll, 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 but there's a, we, we'll keep addressing these issues and problems because it's only when, it's got, when we talk about them. I think that this is what happens: is as more and more people talk about them, more and more people think about different ways of being able to tackle things. And I mean, what you're talking about in enterprise within the the big problem, I'm, I'm sure you. You're, you've got in there is is trust um you, if you don't trust your staff um then it's really hard to let them actually start to be enterprising yeah. and of course it's a reciprocal thing because if they don't trust you as the leader or manager Absolutely. why are they going to tell you about something yeah they're not going to tell you, you what, what... so uh, no so strongly uh, highly recommend i've had a quick little look at, uh, at the book it looks really excellent um, I shall put that on my reading list. It's a long read. I've got seven, <laughs> 700 books on my Kindle at the moment. So, oh, no. That's going to be a job. <laughs> but I've, uh, I've, I've, I've been reading at the moment. You can see this one. This is Jack Canfield's Success Principles. So there's, okay, is that good? Oh, it summarizes everything I've known from 40 years of doing personal development stuff. So fabulous summary of all the things that I, I knew about and didn't do or stopped doing and 
reminding me, oh my God, I should have been doing that. Oh, let's get that back again. So the vision board is the vision board is up and all the things are happening. So it's um, uh, and it's helped me a lot. Things have moved quite a lot in the last few months in, in terms of my confidence. Just uh, and I think but you know the one thing I like about Jack Canfield's approach is number one principle is take responsibility for your life. Just to recognize that everything that happens to you is your responsibility. You cannot blame anyone. And I, I, that's no. the toughest thing to learn, but it's the most important principle. And I think that was absolutely great. You, um, you know, once you take responsibility for your life and recognize that nobody else is to blame for anything that happens, then um, you, you yeah. move on, you move past it. Yeah. So, so you thank you very, very much indeed for joining You're me. Very welcome. It's been lovely to chat. Um, I'm going to, uh, you'll go off screen while I just do a little bit of clothes. If you hang around no in my problem. green, hang around in my green room, we'll just have a quick uh, chat, <laughs> chat afterwards. And Take care. See how we go. So there we go. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for being with me. And uh, thank you for being with me on this, the first Gender Speaker live show. So we're going to be here every Friday around about four o'clock. Might, might be a little earlier sometimes, a little later. Uh, I'm trying to work out when's the best time when it comes to uh, uh, Wi-Fi, because sometimes you probably notice a few little occasions when the Wi-Fi was, was struggling, but we got through most of that. Thank you for being here. Hope you've enjoyed being with the show. And I look forward to seeing you next week on the Gender Speaker Show. Mondays, about 1.30, is going to be the e-speaker live show. Uh, on that show, I'm going to be looking at all things uh, live video, live promotion, how, how do speakers, how do people start to use uh, video live more effectively. So that's my Monday show, which is going to be at 1.30, and the Friday show, the gender speaker. So those are what we're looking for. And I look forward to seeing you either on Monday at 1.30 or Friday at 4. Take care.